Good morning, Grace Point. Um, my name is Ben. I'm the Multiplication Networking Pastor here at Grace Point Church. And I have the honor to be able to kick off our new series called Timeless. And we're looking at ancient examples of courageous faith. And as uh, Steve, Pastor Steve was going on sabbatical, uh, Pastor Aaron had the privilege to kind of like come up with what are we going to do for this five weeks? And, and he chose this idea of what, it, what would it look like for us to dive into the Old Testament and look at characters and stories and examples of what God has done in those moments, knowing that the God of the Old Testament is this, the God that we see in power uh, and promise in all his glory is the same God that we serve today is the same God at work today. So I uh, have chosen Elijah and a specific story in Elijah. So if you have your Bible, if you have um, a phone app with the Bible app, go ahead and open up to 1 Kings 19. Um, But before we get there, I'm gonna share a little story. I happen to be like Pastor Steve and many of you, a Minnesota Vikings fan. I know your pain. Um, We sorrow together. We despair. Uh, My expectations, unfortunately, are through the roof this year. I'm super excited about a new coach. Um, I had some same expectations a little bit back in 2017. Uh, In January 14, 2018, the Minnesota Vikings played the New Orleans Saints in the NFC Divisional Round game. They win this game, they go to the NFC Championship game, and then they play to be able to play in their home stadium for the Super Bowl. It just like was working perfectly, right? Like it was gonna happen. Um, and so they play the Saints. They get up 17 nothing at halftime. The Saints do what the Saints do and they start coming back. And the New Orleans Saints kicked a field goal with like 30 seconds left to go up 24-23. And because I'm a Vikings fan, I started to get my coat on and get ready to head out the door. I'm at my in-laws house. Um, and this is when I was still living in Watertown. I'm getting my coat on, getting the kids coat on because nothing good happens in the last minute of a Minnesota Vikings game. I'm like, thank you. I feel the pain. Um, And so I'm like halfway between the TV and the door and I see Case Keenum chuck up a 30-yard fade to Stephon Diggs who catches it, who then proceeds to not get tackled because the defensive back flew by him and I'm screaming at the television, get out of bounds because I think we can, there's time enough to kick a field goal to win this game. And if this happens, like, they're definitely going to win the Super Bowl. Like, you don't get that lucky and not go all the way. Um, And then it keeps running. And it goes down as one of, like, the greatest plays in NFL history just because of the timing. They walk off against New Orleans Saints, score a touchdown, zero time left. It was incredible. Uh, My mother-in-law, who's the most calm, gentle person I know, was jumping up and down, screaming. I've never seen her act like that. It's awesome. It was just, we just had fun with it. So I'm driving home that night uh, and thinking in my head, like, this is it. This is the year. I know we have another game. We're playing the Philadelphia Eagles who have a backup quarterback. Come on. His luck is going to run out eventually. Um, get to that. So I'm, I absolutely have this expectation. We're not even going to the Super Bowl. We're going to win the Super Bowl. And then they get just absolutely stomped by the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, and I, unfortunately, am incredibly disappointed. Shouldn't have been. It was the Minnesota Vikings. It happens all the time. We've lost on last second field goals. We've missed last second field goals. It's been normal for me as a Vikings fan in this small time I've been on earth to experience heartbreak, but I had such high expectation and the reality of what happened in life didn't meet. And I think that's where we find Elijah in 1 Kings 19. He had this expect, expectation of what was going to happen in life. And that expectation didn't match the reality of what was happening. And so here's the question that we're kind of wrestling with here that we see Elijah come up against. It's how do we respond to circumstances that ultimately result in unmet expectation? Because it happens all the time in life. And what's really difficult, I think, even for us as followers of Jesus is, man, I- I'm trying to do the right things. I'm going to church. I'm praying. I'm reading my Bible. Like, I'm trying to do the the right things. I'm trying to line my life with the truth of God's word. And so if you're like me, I, you potentially get like fall into the trap, like everything should go well. And sometimes that's not the case because life is full of disappointment. And if we're not extremely careful, those unmet expectations ultimately become desires of our heart and we allow them to give us identity, security, and significance. It's like, man, I really thought I'd get into this school. Man, I really thought that this relationship would work out. I really believed that the diagnosis and the treatment that the doctor suggested would work. And we put our whole security and significance in those things. It's good to trust. It's not good to desire and want things to go well. But it's when it doesn't happen, how do we respond? So we look at Elijah. Um, 
quick background prophet was raised up a uh, king ahab is anointed king he marries this gal named jezebel don't know if you know who she's is she's not a great person um she actually had uh, influenced king ahab to turn against yahweh and start worshiping baal who's a false idol and a false god and so elijah's raised up he, he he comes against ahab and says you need to repent you need to turn from this false idol worship and you need to come back towards the lord and worship him and him alone uh, ahab doesn't do that uh and so Elijah goes into hiding for seven years. He says, there's going to be a seven-year drought if you don't turn. So there's a seven-year drought because King Ahab didn't turn. And while he's away, he's living with a widow and her son, and her, her son dies. And Elijah, being a man of God, believing in just the power and provision of God, prayed over the son, touched him three times, and the son was raised to life. So like Elijah has seen incredible things happen. He then gets a meeting set up with King Ahab and basically like creates this showdown. And it's not a testing because I don't ever want to go there, but it's the showdown between the Baal prophets, all 850, and Elijah to see, okay, whose God is the one true God? So Elijah says, all right, you have your priest build an altar. I'll build an altar and we will pray. And whichever God sends fire down from heaven, that is the one true God. So the Baal priests go first. They're hooting and hollering and screaming and praying and doing all these things for hours. And Elijah passively, aggressively goes, maybe your God's asleep. Scream louder. Super aggressive move. Like super intense, like one against 850 and he's taunting them. Woo, that's a lot. And then it's Elijah's turn and he prays. And even before he does that, he has people go fill four big jars of water and pour them on the altar three different times. And he prays and fire from heaven comes down and burns the altar. And scripture even tells us it burned the water and so he's sitting there. Put yourself in Elijah's shoes. You didn't win the competition. God just proved that he is God, right? King Ahab then was able to see, hey, the idol, false God you've been worshiping is not real. What expectation would you have in that moment? Like, if it's me, I'm thinking, this is it. Like, King Ahab is going to turn. He's finally going to repent. He's going to run towards Yahweh. We're going to see. It even says, like, Thousands of Israelites bowed, like fell down prostate, prostate and worshipped. Worshipped Yahweh. It's incredible. Like, there is movement happening within the Israelites. And so if you're Elijah, what would be your expectation? King Ahab's got to repent, right? That's where we pick up. In 1 Kings 19, read with me in verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and, had, and, he, and he, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. This is what I'm calling the unexpected circumstances. See, I absolutely believe, and just absolutely believe, that Elijah had a certain assumption of what was going to happen. How could you not, right? Like you see God's power on display for his glory. And yet all of a sudden you get word that there is heavy death threats after you. Not only did King Ahab not repent and turn, he tattled on, his, on, on you to his wife, who was mean, who had a reputation of violence, hatred. Elijah knew that reputation. So naturally he became afraid. And when we're filled with fear, just again, I think a natural response, we tend to, well, fight or flight, right? And he ran. And I think it's more than just because of the death threat. If you look at in verse three, it says Elijah was afraid. And the root word there of the Hebrew, another meaning for that is he saw. So what did Elijah see? Not something physically, I think it's a perception. He perceived something to be an outcome of what actually may not have happened. I think he heard Jezebel's threats. I think he thought he was going to die. And what he saw was not how God could provide, how God could keep him safe, how God could be his security. What he saw in hearing the threat and what he believed is that he was going to die. So he reacted and he responded. So no longer was God's promise and provision a source of faith and trust and foundation for Elijah. It was Jezebel's threats. And he ran. Now the problem isn't that he ran. The problem isn't that he went into the wilderness to hide. I believe the problem is he didn't, there's no indication here of any direction or leading from the Lord. 
And I think we run into this sometimes. This is just a human thing, right? I think in times of disappointment, this is our problem. We tend to react to the situation instead of respond to the spirit. Because what we see or what we perceive of what we think might happen, we respond to that situation and not sit and not wait a little bit and not rest and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? Because honestly, in heavy disappointment, in really hard situations, in moments of despair, when life is tough, when we have those unmet expectations, it's easy to overthink about the situation and respond to that. Then stop. Say, God, what are you doing? What do you desire for me here? Uh, And so we get into the next scene. And we find Elijah incredibly discouraged. He's hiding. He's depressed. And in verse 4, it says this. He came to a broom brush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush, and he fell asleep. Elijah is legit depressed. He is in a darkness, a despair. He doesn't know what else to do. This is not just an idle, even threat to God saying he's going to kill him. So this is just reality. Like, I want to die because I don't know what else to do. I don't know how to keep going. You showed up. Your power was on display. And yet they still didn't turn. I was faithful to do what you asked me to do. I was obedient in this moment. I was loving in this moment. And yet look what is still happening. He's done. He's absolutely done. Legitimately, I mean, today I think scientists would say he is situationally depressed. And depression comes in a lot of different forms. I think Elijah is situationally depressed, has situational depression. He doesn't know what else to do. He feels alone. He's in a darkness. He's in despair. And what I see in the next few verses and what we're going to talk about is how God comes to Elijah how he meets him in a moment of despair, discouragement, and depression and restores and sees him and is for him. And not restores in one way, in a holistic way. And honestly, that is our big idea for this morning. God desires to see holistic restoration for us always. So not just when things are bad or depressing or dark or we're in despair. He desires for us to see holistic, uh, holistic restoration for us always, but especially in moments of pain and suffering. To pursue not just one avenue of, of treatment or comfort or restoration, but what does it look like? Because we're humans and how we're made, we have a body, we have a soul, we have a mind, we have emotions. How do I holistically pursue restoration, healing from God? And I think we see God show up because that's his desire, because he loves his kids. So where does he start? Um, first, we're going to start with, and again, I titled this The Unanticipated Response of Grace because uh, I think Elijah is just so done. He doesn't, he doesn't probably know how God's going to respond, but how God responds is just how, what God does because he's good and he's gracious. And so going back to verse four, um, there's something about the way language is used about specific prayers and phrases that are used in scripture that I like question. Like I don't understand and I don't get One of them is this, to be able for Elijah to confidently pray, I have had enough, take my life. There's another psalm, there's a psalm in in, in, um, the Psalms, uh, Psalm 88 that's known as the darkest psalm. It's one of two psalms in the entire 150 of them that don't end with a bit of hope. Psalm 88 goes through the psalmist is writing literally everything that he's feeling. He calls what he's in as, as a darkness and a despair. He's depressed. He ends the psalm with, darkness is my closest friend. I feel like Elijah could relate to him. A way that that can be interpreted is basically the psalm is saying, God, right now, I feel like I desire and want darkness to be closer than you are. I desire for darkness to be more of a friend than I want you to be a friend. That's what the psalmist is saying. So I read stuff like that. I think, what are we supposed to do with that as followers of Jesus? Like, we love the word. The word is good for us. What are we supposed to do with something like that? And because there are smarter people than me who have done a lot of decades of research and reading and commentary and know the original language, one of them is a man by the name of Derek Kidner. And he does a lot of, he's an Old Testament scholar specifically with Psalms. And he says this about phrases like this that are in the Bible. He says, the very presence of these prayers in scripture is a witness to God's understanding. God knows how men speak when they are 
desperate. See, if we believe that this word and this book is inspired, there's a reason those phrases, those words, and those sayings were kept in it. And I think one of them is for God to let us know, hey, I get it. I understand. How can he understand? How can even Jesus potentially understand? The greatest moment of despair and darkness in Jesus' life was on the cross. When he took our sin, he was separated from God for a moment. And if in Jesus' own darkness, he didn't abandon us that we'd be saved, he will not abandon us when we're in our darkness, when we're in our despair, when we're in our discouragement. I think that here, by even allowing or having Elijah express this honestly, what's happening is God is restoring him mentally. There, I think, is a mental freedom to being able to openly express and be honest about what our situation is like. Feelings in and of themselves are neither good or bad. Uh, I think it's what we do with them. It's how we respond to them. Do we suppress them? Do we express them? I think to really get at the root of what we're feeling and what's going on in our own soul, we have to express them because we have to process them, and that's a good thing. And so being able to express, um, express our emotions openly and honestly brings some mental restoration and comfort and healing. And I think that's what's happening here. God is restoring Elijah mentally. Um, two years ago, I was going on a mission trip, uh, taking some Oasis peeps, I think we had 20-some, uh, to a mission trip in Southern Texas. And the week went really good. Like, it was a really good week. Um, but we had one kid who was just kind of getting sicker and sicker as the days were going by. And we ultimately got to the end of the week, and I had to take him to the hospital, and he ended up having a brain infection. Um, ultimately, I, he needed five or six surgeries. Um, he's alive today. He's getting married in, like, five months. It's incredible. Like, God's power on display in this kid's life. Um, but I was sitting with him, take him, took him to the hospital, sitting with him in the hospital, waiting for his parents to come down. And I was just sitting in the hospital and on my ride home, my flight home by myself to, to Brookings, um, or, and even over the next few weeks, there would be these questions that would pop into my mind of, man, how could I have reacted sooner? Like, how could I, because there's something I could have done that wouldn't have allowed him to get to the spaces where he almost died. And then the questions became statements about who I was. It's like, man, you, what kind of pastor are you that you would let it get this far? that you would have a kid almost die on your watch on a mission trip. Now, how could God love you when you almost killed a kid? These were the things I was wrestling with for weeks after I came back from this mission trip. And what I wanted to do is, and what I did do is I prayed through it. I feel like there was attack that was happening on me from the enemy and I was praying through it. And for a couple hours every morning for weeks would just try to fight these statements and fight these questions, trying to believe, I know this isn't real. But then ultimately it started to become real, like in my soul. Like what I believed or what I knew intellectually to be true about who God is, all of a sudden for the first time in my life as a follower of Jesus, I didn't believe or I was struggling to really believe it and grasp it and hold on to it. But I wasn't being honest with that reality. And so the statements and the lies that were being thrown at me became harder and harder to wrestle with. So one day I said that to God. I said, God, I'm legitimately mad. Like I'm angry because I'm frustrated that I continually go through this battle. I'm frustrated at these questions that keep popping into my mind, these statements that keep popping into my mind. And God, what I think to be true about who, what this says, I'm struggling to believe. And I said that. And I was honest about it. And it was weird even saying it. And then I told that to my wife. And then I told that to a friend. And there was something about the honest expression of what was really going on in my soul and in my life that started to bring freedom. Because yes, there's a statement that says the truth hurts, but the word also says that the truth will set you free. And that started to happen to me. And it was a process, it didn't happen quickly. But as I openly expressed honestly what was going on in my soul, I started to get some restoration mentally. There started to be some freedom a little bit more. And all of a sudden, belief started to come back up. It, I think as Elijah expresses his emotions honestly here, what's really going on, he's praying. He's talking to God. He at least took that step. And in doing that, I think God brings some restoration and comfort. The second thing we see is God restores Elijah physically. God restores Elijah physically. This is my favorite aspect of this whole story. Um, I think what we'll read here in verses five through nine are just, it's really, really cool. Uh, so we'll go, verse five. It says, then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. 
All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head he, uh, was some bread, and there by his head was some, oh, excuse me, was some bread uh, baked over hot coals in a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Sometimes when we're in those moments, and maybe it's a depression for you, maybe it's just a discouraging time, maybe it's a discouraging season or moment, maybe you're just tired, the best thing is not necessarily another sermon or book or podcast or memorizing a verse. The best thing you could do is take a nap and eat a good meal. Like, this is what God shows. This is incredible to me. God didn't wake up Elijah and say, hey, we got work to do. Ahab is still doing his thing. We got to get moving. No, God, in all his wisdom and goodness, said, hey, why don't you just eat, get some rest? Because you know what? That's sometimes what we need, is to take a nap, legitimately, is to eat a good meal. And some of this uh, is based on your own personality, um, of what gives you rest even physically, but to find those things in your life of what gives you rest. So I'm an extrovert. Um, I love being with people. I also, my number one love language is physical touch. Uh, so that, like, my, and my wife's least favorite love language is physical touch. So our marriage is fun. Uh, there's a lot of great compromise. She's incredible. Uh, she serves me well. Uh, and so, like, during this season of depression that I was having, as I was fighting these battles, it was also covid Literally, the week we were on spring break trip was when all colleges were starting to shut down. They say we're not meeting in person anymore. Uh, we decided that during that week to not have Oasis in person. That's when then everything started to go online. It's like, all right, now I got to be away from people during this time. Like, and so for me, sometimes physical, like even just comfort is a hug. And that sound, may sound weird, but that's just how I was created. Like, that's just how God created me. And so, and apparently during COVID, this is a time where we got a lot of like projects done, right? You guys remember that? Like everyone went to Lowe's. You had your mask, like Lowe's made bank because uh, we all got things done at home. And so there was something I was doing. I can't remember what I was doing, but I entered it. I walked into Lowe's and on my right, I see someone checking out that I had only seen on the screen for like the last month. During Zoom meetings, uh, preaching here at Grace Point, it was Pastor Aaron. And I saw him over there and we made eye contact. And some of you guys will know, it's like, you make eye contact where like, you don't have to say anything. You just know, right? You just like, oh, like where your heart's just like, oh, it's just so stinking good to see you, but you don't need to say it. And then what happened next was a top five hug in my life. We had the embrace of like all embraces. Abby has the other four because we're married, but this was just, it just did something different in my, I don't know what it was. It was just a friend who I hadn't been near or around for a long time where it was like, man, we're going through the same thing. This sucks. And this is hard. Let's just hold each other for a little, like the weird, like, like think if you're alone, there's like, I don't know if there's a worker here at Lowe's, like who are these two guys? Random, like this guy walks in from the, from the parking lot and starts hugging this other guy. This is weird. But man, I'll tell you, it did something to me. It just, there was an encouragement to my soul in that moment. Um, Cause it wasn't just a coworker, right? It was a close friend. We've had some heavy conversations just about life. So I was like, oh, it's, it's just good to see you. It's good to see you. I don't think we gave each other code in that moment, but it wouldn't have mattered anyway. <laughs> just kidding. So maybe your action step for today is like, know what gives you physical rest. Because in moments of discouragement and despair, when we're tired and we're at our wits end, sometimes what you need is a nap or a happy meal, <laughs> a good meal, right? Maybe a vacation, maybe a hug. Maybe if you like working out, it's a workout. Good luck to you. Well, maybe that's it. I know people like that. He's sitting over there, weirdo. <laughs> but it's real. Know yourself enough to know what can give you some physical rest in a moment. And even know there, I think there's opportunity that God's restoring and providing in ways that you can't even imagine. Why I can't explain why that hug meant so much, I think because God did something in my soul that I can't explain. There was some comfort and restoration happening there that I just needed. Um, and then the next thing we see is, I think God restores Elijah spiritually. And by spiritually, I mean relationship with his father, relationship with God. The next bit of scripture of what we see in verses, uh, basically 9b through 18, uh, is this great story that uh, if you've been in the church uh, a while, you'll know this story. And a lot of times when we talk about this story, is we talk, it's on prayer and hearing God's voice and what does that look like and what expectations do we have and what it looks like to hear God's voice. Um, 
And it's Elijah being told by God to go to the mountain. So I'll read, I'm gonna start at verse 11 and we're gonna read through 14. It says this. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Um, just try to picture this with me. I think when the Lord says to Elijah, go to the mountain, the Lord's about to pass by. If I hear that, I'm going to stand at the mouth of the cave and see and wait until the Lord passes by. I think when the wind came and the earthquake came and the fire came, Elijah went back into the cave. As I break things. I think he went back into the cave. Could God have showed up in an earthquake? Yeah, he has. Showed up in a fire all the time. We see that in the Old Testament. In the heavy wind, absolutely. He chose not to in that moment. And what brought Elijah back out to the mouth of the cave as he put a cloak on him was not the fire or the earthquake or a heavy wind, but a gentle whisper. As if to say, in my presence, what I desire for you to know is I'm for you and I love you. Because sometimes in God's presence, what we're reminded of most and what brought Elijah into God's presence was a gentle whisper is that he is a God of simple love and subtle kindness. And I think that more than anything, definitely for me, I think here in this moment for Elijah, restored him spiritually, reminded him again of who his God was. Reminds me of Romans 2, 4. It's not a harsh word. It's not a harsh judgment that leads us to repentance. It's God's kindness. It's a gentle whisper that reminds Elijah, I love you and I'm for you. Right? Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. The promise we get over and over again. I think sometimes uh, when we're in these moments and, and when, when life hits and those expectations are crashed and we're discouraged and maybe in a spot of despair or just frustrated and angry, what we want most is an earthquake or a fire or a heavy wind. But what we need is a gentle whisper. What does that look like? For me, it's been doing John 15, where Jesus said, abide in me and I will abide in you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. It's not necessarily action steps to take. It's abiding in the heart of God, resting in God's heart for you. Maybe struggling and wrestling with believing, does he really love me? Believing if he's really there, but it's repeating over and over in your mind. God, you say in your word, you will never leave or forsake. God, you say in Romans 8 that nothing can separate, separate from me, me from your love. That's a gentle whisper. And it's that that leads us towards repentance, which repentance is just turning from our own selfish ways and running towards Jesus. I think in that moment, in a gentle whisper, Elijah is restored spiritually. One last thing. Um, I think what's really beautiful about not just this story, but how God works is there's moments, even when life seems to be going well, we still need to pursue restoration and renovation. Like that's the idea of sanctification, of becoming more like Jesus in every aspect of our life. Um, and then we get in those moments where we feel that restoration. And maybe again, like, it is, like I said, it's in heavy times and maybe it's not. But I know for me, when I was going through the process of what I was going through in my own little darkness and despair, um, as I received restoration physically and emotionally and mentally and spiritually, just being reminded of, of all the goodness of God, not knowing I was walking this walk not alone, but with other people. I think what God does in those moments is in providing complete restoration, he prepares us for what's ahead. So the comfort we receive in our circumstances is sometimes the contribution that we need to continue on. It's yes for the moment to be able to come back and, and get the restoration, healing, and comfort we need to con just to be with God. Right? And just to sit in his presence and his goodness. But also that is a moment of preparing. He's getting us ready for something. We don't have to know what that something is. Elijah was lucky enough here in this moment to know what his next steps were. He knew that the restoration that was coming, that getting away and being in the mountain and being with God. Um, God then said, well, we're not done. There was still a challenge. There were still next steps. Hey, uh, we still got to go. You still got to go prophesy against King Ahab. You need to anoint two new kings. Right? You need to raise up and delegate Elisha to be the next prophet. But I think the restoration that he, the way that God provided in the moment then was preparing him for what's next. 
So that leaves us this morning with three questions. Um, How do you need restoration this week? Like just what does that look for you? Holistically, physically, uh, mentally, or spiritually. Maybe it's a moment where you just, you have a lot going on this week or the next couple weeks are heavy. It's, I mean, you got kind of a long weekend. Maybe you just kind of need it. Instead of either scheduling more one-on-ones or scheduling more meetings or scheduling more events, maybe you just need to sit and chill and take a nap and rest physically. Maybe you need to allow yourself um, to just look up some of the promises of God and just rest in them and read them and sit in them. Or maybe for the first time in a long time or maybe ever, you need to express honestly for the first time what's really going on in your soul, what's really going on in your life. Express it honestly to God. He can handle it. He can take it. He's a God of grace. Second question, what does trust look like for you this week? So maybe you sit and you're you're reading through the promises of God and you're going through life. God knows what you're going through and you just need an act of provision. You need his hand, his favor on something in your life. So what does it look like for you to trust him this week with that? To surrender it, to give it to him. Um, Last question. Uh, How is God preparing you for what's next by providing for you right now? Um, This one for me is, is huge just in the mere sense that I get encouragement from knowing that what I'm going through, I don't need to know the cause. I don't need to know the why. I need to rest and know and remember that God is with me. He is here. He has not left or forsaken me. And that also then prepares me for what's moving forward. Because even when I get into that next moment of despair or the next discouragement or that next situation where my expectation of what I thought was going to happen got crushed, I can look back and see, hey, this was where God moved when I was in that moment. He'll move again. He'll move again. Let's pray. Um, Father, we thank you for just this morning. Thank you for opportunity to come and together as your sons and daughters to to worship you first and foremost and give you glory glory through music and prayer. God, we thank you um, just for how you continue to move in our lives, in this church, in this community. We thank you for your word. We thank you how you met Elijah in a place, in a moment of despair and discouragement and how you promised to meet us too with wherever we're at. God, I thank you that you know the stories of every single person here. You know the expectations that haven't been met of every single person here. You know the realities and the situations and circumstances of what everyone is going through. And God, in this moment, would you, yes, increase our faith to be able to trust you with those things? But also, would you show how you do, show yourself to be faithful? God, I praise and thank you for your goodness and kindness. That which does lead us to repentance, lead us to turning back to you. For those here who are waiting for you to pass by, God, would you give them a gentle whisper? For those who need provision in their life, God, provide like only you can. We'll trust you in the process. Thank you for this moment. Help us now to be able to just express openly and honestly our worship to you, but also with what we're feeling and what's going on in our own soul. We praise you, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.